So Rima asked me to be a part of this panel and speak for 15 minutes. Um, and I at first thought, well, I don't really have much to say that's going to fill 15 minutes. And then I started thinking about the ways in which my experiences as a mixed race person um, intersected with all of the other facets of who I am. And then I thought, well, where do I even begin? Um, so I'll perhaps start with how I came into existence. Um, my, as Rima mentioned in my bio and as it's written in the booklet, um, my, on my dad's side, I'm Zulu and Swati. Um, my dad is originally from uh, Swaziland by way of South Africa. He left Swaziland when he was 13 years old um, and joined the African National Congress in South Africa and was fighting against apartheid um, and was an active member throughout um, his teenage years and into his adult life, um, even after he came to Canada, was still an active member of the ANC and continued to go back and continue his anti-apartheid activism. Um, on my mom's side, I am uh, Filipino. My mom is Filipino, originally from the Philippines. Um, her maternal ancestry is mixed. Oh, sorry. Uh, her maternal ancestry is mixed with um, with Chinese as well, um, sort of going quite far back, and as with most Filipinos, if you go even further back, there's some Spanish mixed in there, but I don't necessarily claim that. Um, my parents come from really sort of disparate um, backgrounds, obviously. Um, my dad came to Canada as a refugee, um, he came from Swaziland, which is the poorest country in the world currently, um, and even was so at the time from, um, from when he came, um, and ended up coming here uh, to Winnipeg, actually, um, in the early 80s, um, and settling directly from South Africa in, in Winnipeg. Um, I can hold the mic. Yeah, okay. Um, what was I saying, where was I? So yeah, and uh, on my mom's side, my mom's family is actually quite well off in the Philippines and still are. There are a reported 230 something families that kind of run and hold all of the resources in the Philippines. Sarah's smiling at me. Um, and my mom's family is sort of part of that set. Um, so. Back home, uh, she grew up in an environment that was houses that had courtyards and pools in the middle of the courtyard, and there were servants and uh, maids and chauffeurs and all of that kind of thing. Um, and she and her family had a considerable class drop when they came uh, to this country in the mid-70s. Um, I, my parents met in Winnipeg, um, and I was born in 89. Um, and growing up in Winnipeg in the 90s, at that time it was pretty homogeneously white. Um, in my neighborhood, we were the only family of color, um, and when I went to daycare, I think I was, of the 200 or so kids in the daycare, I was maybe one of three people of color. Um, it's not much better now. Um, when I went to elementary school, I was rolled, uh, elementary and middle school, I went to the same school from K to eight. Um, and there were 200 something kids and it was a private Catholic school, super rich um, demographic um, and also homogeneously white. My, the class that I was a part of was the only class that had any people of color in it and I was one of three, again. Um, the neighborhood that I grew up in was a military neighborhood. It was notorious, it's notorious to this day for voting conservative. Um, so the experiences that I had of being a mixed race person and constantly having, you know, being interrogated, I mean, walking out um, of my house on a daily basis was a struggle. There were instances where I would go out to check the mail and 20 minutes later, there would be a police officer knocking on the door because a neighbor thought that I was trying to break into the house. Um, 
going to school on the bus was like was always a thing like people would try to kick me off of the bus like I was you know I would always be late to school um, because it would you know I would have to get off of a bus and then try to catch the next one the bus might drive past me so that kind of thing was like consistent all throughout my childhood um, at the age of I would say 11 or so um, was when I kind of started to realize that I was also queer. Um, by that point, I had been so excluded from my community and so othered that coming to terms with that was actually a far easier process to negotiate mm -hmm. um, because of my outsider status um, than, than it, I think for, you know, a lot of people really struggle with it. I didn't really, it was just kind of a light bulb that went off and I was kind of like, oh, Okay, well, there's another thing to throw onto the pile. <laughs> um, yeah, and grow, I, I am also, like Kim, um, a proud university walkout. Um, so I, I actually, I, high school, I should start with high school, I guess. Uh, moving into high school, I went to a homogeneously, homogeneously white high school. Um, this was kind of like going into the sort of late 90s, or early 2000s, I guess. Um, the sort of immigration wave to Manitoba had kind of picked up again, um, and the city was kind of starting to grapple with the changing demographics. Uh, high school for me was a really violent environment. I kind of stopped showing up and I kind of skipped over it. Um, I was really, really lucky to have had um, one really supportive teacher who advocated for me the entire way through and I was able to actually kind of skip over everything and just write the exam, so I actually really didn't show up at high school for about 90% of it. Um, and then moving into university, I started off at the University of, uh, of Winnipeg, um, which, I, the prairies is kind of like living in a different country, which is, uh, the best way that I can put it, but uh, it's it's a little bit like living in a small town, except you're not, so it makes no sense. Um, so I yeah, so I started off at the University of Winnipeg and and kind of became frustrated with how much sort of Western bias was just sort of entrenched in um, in everything that I was learning, um, and I was studying filmmaking and theater. Uh, and there was just no acknowledgement of the ways in which people of color have uh, contributed to the what we call the standards of what makes good performance or good art, good performing art today. Um, and so I ended up going to BC to study um, where I found more integration of African contributions and um, Indian contributions and, um, and indigenous contributions. Um, and so I was able to kind of get what I needed out of that education um, and, and sort of incorporate that into my, into my creative practice, which I still continue to do today. Um, and then when it became sort of time for me to, when I, when I felt that I had sort of gotten everything that I needed out of my education, that was sort of when I walked out because at the end of the day, the academy is, is very sort of, it's still, as much as people try, it's still very much entrenched in colonial structures and in, um, in sort of in, in white supremacy. Um, and so I, at a certain point, had had enough and I wanted to figure out a way to decolonize my art practice and figure out a way to, to create and produce expressions and reflections of culture that, um, that were not appeasing of um, and placating uh, the current people who are steering the narrative of what Canada is and what Canada looks like. Um, and so that's kind of where I am now currently is, is sort of creating platforms um, in my work and, and in my sort of own personal journey to, um, to raise other, like help other people, um, help other people sort of speak up um, and give them the platforms to, to be able to do that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's my experience. That's, that's how, I, and now I'm sitting here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. This is is this good? Okay. <laughs> Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, hello everyone. Um, again, my name is Latasha. I go by Cairo. I'm from the Eastern Woodland Métis Nation of Nova Scotia. And so my spirit name is Songao Dekinu, which means strong-hearted eagle, and I'm from Eagle Clan. And my mix, I identify as indigenous Afro-Caribbean Canadian. So my mother is Mi'kmaq, but also the descendants of the slaves that went to Nova Scotia. And on my father's side, we are a whole lot of mixes. So uh, Guyanese, yes, but we are a mixture of Ecuadorian and the Amerindian communities. And from my trip to Guyana a few weeks ago, I actually found out from one of my aunties who's documenting our history that the name of the slave ship that went to Guyana is Brooker. And so our first ancestor to Guyana is Thomas Brooker, and he was 12 years old, and he was from Ghana. So learned a lot on this trip. And so uh, why I'm here is basically, I was told by someone from an organization called Indigenous, um, Indigenous Youth Partnership Project. Uh, my Sisters of the Soul was actually funded by one of these organizations and they came across this conference and thought I'd be perfect for it in terms of the work that I'm doing. And so I looked into it and I thought, wow, like, I literally have never seen anything. Mind you, I wasn't really looking that hard, but this to me was really incredible because I haven't had many opportunities to have my identities feel harmonized in one space before. Mm -hmm. So I felt that this was a great opportunity for me, especially as a black presenting person, to feel comfortable speaking about my indigeneity, my blackness, and everything else that's within me. To start from the beginning, so I wasn't really too into my mixed identity when I was younger. I grew up in Milton, and I was already dealing with being visibly um, the only black person that I knew in my school, um, Holy Rosary Catholic School, horrible school, anyways. Moving on, but for me, I was the only person that I knew that was black, especially in the younger grades. And so I was just trying to deal with that for a lot of time, and I felt like knowing more about my identity was really complicated at the time, so I was just settling for kind of fighting the racism that I was experiencing as a black youth. It wasn't until 2009 when my great-grandmother, Dorothy Frazier, passed away that there was this initiative in my family to find out more about our ancestry. And so my great-grandmother, we always knew, she raised my mom, so she was my grandmother. Um, we always knew that she was indigenous, we knew she was mixed with Mi'kmaq, but it was something that was never really talked much about. Um, in fact, there was a lot of internalized racism within my family. Um, so we really didn't talk much about it, it wasn't necessary. And I should also say as well that my family has suffered from a lot of substance abuse as well. So there were so many different things that we were dealing with that we felt took precedent over looking into our history. But when my great-grandmother passed away, I felt a real sense of loss. And she actually passed away from Alzheimer complications. And it was just very ironic that in the last years of my great-grandmother's um, life, that she was forgetting who she was and she was forgetting who her family was. And I really think that that part is what really broke her heart and killed her. It really took away her spirit. And so for me, I really wanted to do something that honored her and learn more about myself so that I could pass on those stories and they won't die with me when I leave this world. And so we started by getting our status card and looking into um, the specific nations that our family's from. And at first I thought it was kind of cool and interesting, but it wasn't until I really started dealing with personal mental health issues that I realized how linked my identity is to my health. And for a lot of time I was neglecting who I was, so I was very fragmented and meeting friends in university, which by the way, took 10 years to get my undergrad. Um, but luckily, towards the end, I kind of got the hang of it and started networking a little bit more. And I met friends who were indigenous as well. And so I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to know a bit more about what that sense of community meant for me and where do I fit into this? Because I often felt like the way I look meant that I had to identify only as black because walking into certain spaces, I didn't feel like I would be accepted as being anything other than that. 
And that has been true in some ways, but I think that for the most part, understanding why it's been true is more important than just accepting it. And so I felt like identifying holistically within myself was a part of my resiliency. And it was a part of my family's resiliency to speak our truth and to not have anybody tell our story for us. And so um, that kind of brought me to the present day. And so I wanted to do a lot more work. And I think what was really important to me in terms of looking at my identity, what I thought perhaps I could offer this world is that I see a lot of spaces where indigenous and people of color speak, where we get together but there's not a lot of dialogue on solidarity between the two communities from what I've experienced. I hear a lot about reconciliation and have even worked with organizations that pride themselves on centering their organization's values on reconciliation. But I often found it took a very white-centered approach to reconciliation. And so I felt that whiteness was centered in a way where it spoke more about the European relationship with indigenous communities as opposed to other people of color communities. And so once again, I felt alienated and isolated. So I wanted to take opportunities to create a space that felt safe for people of color and indigenous people to speak because obviously we were here. But if you look at the history, you would think the only people who lived here were indigenous and European people, which we know isn't true, right? And then when you talk about black identity politics and black oppression or anti-black racism, you would think the only people lived here was black people and white people, right? So I think that that in itself is a process of divide and conquer so that, again, as Kim was saying, we see ourselves as a minority as opposed to the majority. So if we're always fragmenting ourselves from our larger community, then it's, a, it's very easy to feel isolated. So that's where I got the idea of Sisters of the Soil. And I wanted, I used the word sisters of the soil, the term, because I wanted to root our relationship in something that wasn't so colonial, something that wasn't tainted, something that wasn't um, based on the Indian Act in terms of my identity. So I wanted to root the sisterhood in the soil, which is something that we're all connected to. And so the organization, we do a lot of workshops with women of color and indigenous women, and it's centered on a process of decolonization from a theorist called Poka Lanui. And in this process of decolonization, he has these five stages that he says are necessary. So recovery and rediscovery, which is looking at our history. Mourning, which is having the space to mourn from those histories. Dreaming, which is the ability to see a different future as a collective, but also as an individual. Um, committing, so being able as a community and as an individual to commit to those processes, to commit to those dreams. And the final stage is action, which I think is ongoing. And I, in fact, when you think about it, decolonizing our minds and the way we see ourselves and our identity is something that I don't think truly ever ends. And so I really wanted to do this work and I wanted to find more spaces to kind of talk about this idea of decolonizing our community and ourselves. And so I find myself in venues like this where I meet people from various different backgrounds, but in some way, we all seem so whole, so right, and so put together and like this perfect combination of who we are spiritually. And so I wanna continue that work and I thank the organizers for having me here and I'll be a part of some of the breakout sessions to speak a little deeper on the things that I work on and also the things that I've been thinking about recently and I hope to have very stimulating dialogues and thank you. Yeah, for that. Sego, what's going to be lado? Jamais ni angets, what's going to be wage? Ganyaga aga, kwe, ongwe homwe. And that's about as far as I can go with my introduction in ongwewena, which is uh, indigenous language. So I was greeting you all, saying it's really good to see everybody here. Hello, my name is Jamais. I'm Bear Clan. I'm Mohawk. But I actually identify as a mixed settler. Um, I also want to give a big thanks to Rima, uh, my sister in my heart, um, for, for organizing this and for seeing it through and, and um, bringing everybody together today. Um, this is a really important conversation. Um, I think more so now than ever, um, because we're, we're seeing all of the oppression that has been going on for the last 500 years is really, um, the veil is, has been pushed aside and we're seeing it for what it is now. So we all have a responsibility to do stuff, 
And part of that means we need to look at ourselves, we need to look at our location, where we're coming from. And that's something I've spent a lot of time doing um, because of my own personal history. So I am the descendant of Decaronyanagon Diom, um, who was uh, a Mohawk man who married Marie, and I don't know her last name, and she was a Cree woman, and they left Gon he left Ganawagi, and they settled in Tweed, Ontario, and they assimilated. And then they raised their kids to assimilate. And so my grandfather was raised to deny who he was. Um, he had a white father, and his mother was the descendant of, of uh, Degaron Yanagon and Marie. And, uh, and so he was raised to really deny who he was. And that served several purposes, one of which was to protect the kids from being taken away. Um, and also, I think, just to try and fly under the radar from the colonial violence that is happening to this day, but has been happening since then, um, and even before then. So that's on my mother's side. And then my, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, is of Irish descent, and she's the only person I am descended from that is not of mixed ancestry. So then on my father's side, my father is Jamaican, and that's a whole slew of things, as you heard in my bio, including, um, and this is patchwork anecdotes that I've put together from years of interrogating my grandparents, much to their, because they don't talk about those things. And that's what they would say to me. We don't talk about those things. But um, so African, um, Sephardic Jew, Portuguese, as my last name shows, um, Colombian, and and, so that was my paternal grandmother. Her mother was Colombian of African descent and um, indigenous, whatever. I don't know the nation, but I just know that's what her ancestry was. And uh, so coming from that complicated uh, background, and then also in Jamaica because of you know the, the colonial imperialism and the way in which shadism operates and the way in which class operates, uh, the my family um, has done a lot of that erasure as well. <laughs> so you know, um, for the longest time I was raised, even though my father is is he presents to the world as as I guess a brown man, um, but you know we wouldn't talk about blackness. Um, and it was not something that was ever acknowledged until I would say the last maybe 10 or 15 years it's, it's become more uh, a conversation that is a little less filled with tension. Um, so, so coming from that I've spent a lot of time thinking about who am I, what is my purpose in life, and, and also having my identity prescribed to me, um, especially when I, I, so I had a very uh, unique experience of growing up mostly in Toronto and then moving to Jamaica for a couple of years, moving to Kingston, and then coming back. And I came back to Canada during my very formative years, so I started high school here, having moved straight from Kingston, and moved into um, a very white neighborhood. It was the whitest neighborhood I think I had ever lived in because my parents moved a lot when I was growing up. Um, and it was the beaches. Anybody know the beaches? It's a pretty privileged neighborhood, but it's an interesting intersection. So I moved from Kingston to Kingston Road in Victoria Park. <laughs> and there are there's a class divide that happens along Kingston Road. Um, so if you're north of Kingston Road, then you're not in that heavy-duty, privileged space. If you're south of Kingston Road, the, it's all like million-dollar homes, and um, a lot of the kids, you know, would get their parents' credit card and go shopping on the weekend while everybody else was working. Um, and then there was this obsession with anything that was, you know, um, I guess they would consider exotic. So, you know, here I was this light-skinned person coming from Jamaica, and then everybody was like, what are you? So Kim, when Kim was talking about that, that I think probably most of us in this room have experienced that on multiple levels, multiple times in our lives. And um, I didn't really know who I was, so I never knew how to answer that question. Um, 
but they would, the, some of the girls that I knew would actually have these sort of conversations and prescribe my identity for me, which was fun. And there was a lot of discussion about my father in particular, because my mom is white passing. Um, and even though I've always, that is the one thing that I always knew, Mohawk, like my grandfather, even though he was raised to deny his indigeneity, he was very, very proud to be Mohawk. And I grew up with a lot of stories from him because I was pretty close with him. Um, so I, I was fortunate uh, to have that as somewhat of an anchor in terms of this identity. But my father is much more ambiguous. He's a brown man. Um, I, I was told he looked like a terrorist. Um, and then there was uh, this conversation about, is he black? He's not really black. You're not black. You're a mulatto. You're a half breed. You're not really a half breed. And it was, it was very confusing because I, I didn't know. And I would try and talk to my parents. And my parents were still not really they didn't even have a grasp on who they were. Neither of them did, really. Um, I mean, I guess my mom did more so than my father. But uh, so identity is something I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. As I've grown older, um, you know, I've moved past the who am I stage to, OK, now what do I do with all this information about who I am? Um, so the fact that I present to the world as a, a white person, most people read me in that way, means I have a lot of privilege. And, um, and so, and even that has actually been a deterrent in terms of how I identify because, um, you know, taking up space as a person of color is not something I, 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 I even to this day, I, I don't feel perfectly comfortable doing that because I know I move through the world with a, an amount of privilege that my father can't move through the world. Um, and so, this idea of negotiating identity, negotiating the complexity of white supremacy and how it operates in my family, um, and then also just how I am in the world. Um, it's, it's been an ongoing learning process for me. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years has been around this very thing, around sort of trying to plant seeds <laughs> with especially um, in schools because my daughter started to experience racism about, I would say, I mean, she, she overt racism, because I'm sure they're systemically, you know, it's always there, but overtly she was experiencing racism quite a while back. She's about to graduate high school. And, uh, and I started doing workshops in the school around privilege and talking to kids about privilege is fun because <laughs> most of them are really interested in the conversation and you really hear some, some amazing things from kids. And, um, but it can also be really, really complicated because a lot of kids, you know, they don't, they don't see the world in that way necessarily. Um, and to even prescribe, you know, racialized... <laughs> Uh, lens to children is is complicated and it's it's a difficult thing to do and it's a difficult conversation to have um, but it's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about personally so it's something that I've tried to do um, um, simply because the teacher at the time was not equipped to deal with it and said well why don't you come and talk to the class and um, if there are any parents in the room I'm sure you've experienced something similar um, I've talked to other parents who have gone through this. The system is so intrinsically racist, and any time as a parent, especially as a parent who is racialized in any way, you try to um, um, you know, have those conversations with educators, often it, it seems that they, because they're not equipped, they sort of lob the ball back to the parent and ask the parent to do the work. Um, and fortunately for me, I, I really love working with kids, and I really love this this topic. It, it it's something that because it's so personal to me, I'm really comfortable talking about. So, um, so that's that's something that I've spent a lot of time doing, and I'm really looking forward to having these conversations with all of you, um, because I know that we all come from a, our own unique perspectives, and that's one of the things. I think that's probably the only thing that you can say applies to every mixed person. We're all different. We all have we all have different experiences. We're all we all have our own unique mix. We all have our own unique experiences of you know 
navigating the world in that way and, and trying to syncretize ourselves um, through that patchwork. So I'm very excited to be here. I want to say thank you again to Rima and to everybody who organized. And, uh, and I look forward to talking some more. Hello. Hi. Is this OK? Maybe I'll hold it. OK. Is this better? OK. Hi, everyone. My name's Nadu. Um, I think today I'm just going to share with you like my journey through how I learned about my mixed race identity and why I'm here and kind of where I'm going from there. Um, thank you all for being here and sharing. Um, and thank you all who've already shared your story and Rima for inviting me out. I think that there's a lot of um, power that comes with sharing your story and having it heard in a really meaningful way can be super healing, or at least in my experience it is. So thank you for contributing to my healing process. Okay, so um, my journey begins when I was told that I was mixed race by my mom when I was around the age of 10, maybe a little bit younger than that. I didn't know that I was mixed race because um, I don't know who my biological father is. Um, and I don't think I've ever met him. I don't even know if he knows I exist. Um, and it wasn't until my mom told me that I was mixed race where I actually started thinking about race and my mixed race identity because I grew up like Rima, predominantly all white town, all white school, all white family, like my mother is white, all my siblings, and um, my dad is white as well, even though he's not my biological, I still refer to him in that way. Um, and so I was told this information and was like, oh, cool. And I just kept moving through the world in that way until high school hit grade nine. First day, I'll never forget it. I was walking through the school, didn't know anyone, didn't have any friends. And there was a small group of black folks who were like, hey, you, mixed race one or mixed, I can't remember how she referred to me, but she called me out and I was like, me? <laughs> Yes, you, and she called me over, her name's Lisi, and we don't keep in touch today, but we are still in touch, and she said to me, you're mixed, aren't you? And it was the first time in my life I ever had someone see me and acknowledge me in that respect, so it was very like, oh, I'm exposed, and I don't know how to do this thing, and um, yeah, so that was the first time in my life that I felt accepted and, and seen as a mixed race person because I feel that I also access white passing privilege where I live and where I stay. I believe everyone reads me as white um, or Italian or Spanish or all the things like a chameleon I can just blend with most things. And, um, and then this question came, so what are you? What is your mix like? What's your background? And I never, had to think about it in that, in that space because I just kind of um, conformed to the world around me and um, my privilege of being able to pass as white kind of helped in that and um, it was extraordinarily devastating to have to think about that and not having the connection to my blackness, not knowing my dad, not knowing anything about him. Um, and it immediately brought up a huge like a hurt and a sense of um, loss of guilt and shame and how do I move through the world with with this huge piece of information that's missing and um, and then of course questions started coming so I asked my mom can you tell me about my dad more than that he's just black and she's like oh and told me his name and and that was it like she didn't she couldn't remember a lot and she because she also is an active addiction so she doesn't have the greatest memory and um, my grandfather father when he was alive was also very racist too and if they knew that she was with him it would have been like this huge thing so I didn't know for a long time and however at the same respect I was accepted in um, my chosen family which is a small group of black folks in high school and they were like we need to stick together because as you can see we are the only black people in this high school so and it was just so like whoa for me it was just so like whoa and 
My journey continues feeling like I feel too white to be with these, these folks who I refer to as my chosen family, and I feel way too black to be at home with like my white family and moving through the world. And I don't know how to describe it more than just saying that, but that was my experience and um, never felt like I fit in, never felt like I belonged anywhere. And um, as a result of that, among with many other factors, um, I fell into drugs and alcohol. And I, um, I don't know if like the disease, disease of addiction was there before I found the substances or if it came as a result, but um, I used for years. And that was like my coping to deal with not feeling okay in my racial identity. I didn't like talking about it. I lied about it a lot. When people asked me what my mixed race was, I just, Jamaican and this, like I made it up. I don't even know, I could be Jamaican. I know that um, through a DNA test that I have African ancestry. I don't know what that looks like specifically, but it's there and I'm very like, woo, makes my heart burst to glitter to like have something more than just information that was told to me. Um, yeah, so this is kind of my journey and it kind of, this whole process of like coming to terms with owning and being okay with identifying as a black or mixed race person is very new, very, very new. I just got clean about close to two years ago and when I got clean, my first sponsor um, within Narcotics Anonymous said, you need to know who you are because there's a reason why you use drugs and we need to learn what that is. And it was the first time I actually had to ask myself, who am I and, and what, where is this hurt coming from? And then it came and it was very like, ooh, so lots of work has been done there. Um, what else can I say? Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> So, yeah, so I guess from there, my journey just started with um, a, lot of, a lot of tears, a lot of feelings, um, and just giving myself permission to be a part of black community and being part of mixed race community. And um, for a long time, I had this self-imposed thought process of I don't belong because I even till this day a little bit, I'm very obsessed with skin color and hair texture. And because I don't look this way, I can't be black. And so a part of my journey too was also like playing on to some really harmful stereotypes and um, referring to myself as like mulatto until another black sibling came to me and said, why do you call yourself mulatto? And I was like, because everyone, like that's what my mother called me. That's what, how people, white people specifically referred to me always. And it didn't, it, literally when I was 19 years old and I'm 25 now, I learned that that's actually a really fucked up, harmful term that white people put on us. And um, like if, and just kind of opened up my mind in that way. And it was like a huge, like my whole life, I'm telling people I'm a lotto and I didn't even know that it was a thing and it was really harmful. And like, so this is just some of the learnings that I've had. And um, I don't no longer, I no longer identify as mulatto. I identify as like a mixed race black person, but um, so present day. So today um, I really practice a lot, giving myself permission to forgive myself and to love myself in that way and to see myself as a mixed race person and to own that regardless of how I'm read and, um, and how I move through the world. And, uh, it's, it's hard because I mostly stay in white community and um, because they assume me to be white, I, I get previewed to a lot of really effed up racist conversations and I, I have a hard time navigating that because it's like, do I out myself as a mixed race person, black person, and how do, I, how do I move through the world with this privilege of being able to access whiteness? And it's just, for me, I'm still learning that. And that's why I'm here too, is just to hear from your folks' experience and, and to learn and um, I guess to like wrap it up, things that are helping me move through this really tender, hard, um, but really liberating experience of coming to terms with my blackness and mixed race identity is um, talking about it. So when Rima's like, share your story in front of all of you people, 
when it's like a whole new thing, it was um, very petrifying, but at the same time, very it's very healing and rewarding. And I feel like most folks get it, if not everyone gets it to some respect, so that's cool. Um, talking about it, staying clean and sober. I have a really supportive partner who's just so affirmative of my blackness whenever I'm like, oh, I think I just wanna. Dear, you're black. It's okay. <laughs> Own that. And you know, this is your house and you can stay here and don't let these greater systems of whiteness try to, uh, sorry, I swear a lot, mess your <laughs> stuff up. Like, so that is, is really helpful to just have a community of folks, um, black folks specifically and folks of color who, who love and accept you. And even though I've had that, I think throughout my whole life, I think taking the boldest step of seeing it and recognizing it within myself and loving me for who I am and loving my blackness in its entirety and not having to justify it and explain it to specifically white people. And I keep bringing that up because I, in my experience, the most harm I've experienced was through the system of whiteness. And unfortunately, white people tend to perpetuate that a lot. Not to say that other black folks and people of color don't too, but it's a thing, it all exists, and I feel like I'm entrenched in it, and we're all impacted by it in some way, shape, or form, and it's really shitty. But that's why these conversations are important, and I think I'm rambling now. Um, so I guess just to say that um, I'm, still, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, and this is kind of where I'm at right now in this moment and how I identify, and it's still uncomfortable, it's still hard, I still don't really know um, how to do this race thing, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, but it's okay, and this is my journey, and, um, and I'm just grateful for all of you to listen to me and to, um, to be here too, and I know for me coming in, it was very vulnerable, very, emotional time to come in and and I think it's so amazing and crucial for these spaces to exist because I think it's easy for folks to just kind of fall to the wayside or to um, to pass or to not to pass or just like all of the things but to show up and be present and to be like hey this is who I am is really for me at least um, it's really healing and wonderful. And I think I'm gonna wrap it up with that. Um, thanks all for listening to me and being here and you're all wonderful humans and I can't wait to connect with you more. Um, and that's, that's it, that's all I got. Mm -hmm.